Hello and welcome. So I've got another fun one for you today. I'm going to be talking about the game Wordle, which has sort of taken the world by storm lately. I'm actually pretty late to the bandwagon on this one, but I'm jumping on now anyway, because I've got some things to say about it. Uh, so in case you have been hiding under a bush or can't understand what all these green and yellow and gray things people keep tweeting about or otherwise sharing are about, two minute overview of the game Wordle. The idea is there, there is a secret five-letter word, and you have to guess it by typing in various different five-letter words of your own, and on each of your input words you get scored. Uh, and so, as they show here, what does that mean? Well, if your tile turns green, it means that that letter appears in the secret word in that exact place. If your tile turns yellow, it means that letter appears in the secret word but not in that place. And if t the tile turns gray, it means it's not in the word anywhere. Uh, now, this particular uh, game that you're looking at here, it's not that I'm extremely bad at playing Wordle and keep uh, making really dumb guesses. This is just to show you uh, a little nuance that isn't mentioned in the rules but does become quite important if you try to analyze this game properly, which is how you handle uh, multiple letters. So, uh, in this case, I guess by the time I put this video out, it's going to be too late to be a spoiler, so I'll just tell you the Wordle for today is Thorn. Uh, and so, what am I doing here with all my guesses? I'm showing you, uh, you know, here, I guess a T, that's in, the, that's in the word in that place, that's good. R appears in a different place, so that's a yellow, fine. But now, look at this one, I guess the word trite. So there's two T's in here. This gray T, if I take this literally, is telling me there's not a T in the word anywhere, but obviously that's not compatible with saying there is a T in the word in this position. So the way you have to understand this is to say, aside from the T is already covered by the green, there's not another T. So in other words, a great letter doesn't necessarily mean this doesn't appear anywhere if there's another of the same letter in the guess. Uh, so similarly here, uh, you'll see, you know, there's one of the T's turns yellow, one of them t turns black. Here, one of the three ends turns yellow, but the other two turn gray. So basically, the idea is that if you have multiple matches, obviously anything that's in the right position turns green, and then uh, then you fill in yellow from the left until you have as many yellows, sorry, as many yellows plus greens as are in the actual word. So, in other words, here you fill in the first one N, but not the rest. If the N was actually in this position, then you'd have gray here and here and a green one here. Um, so that's probably a little bit more thought than you've given to the nuances of multiple letters if you played Wordle, but you do need to get into that level of detail to uh, to play the game. So anyway, I'm going to show you two, uh, two things that I've done with Wordle in Excel uh, today. So one of them is uh, I enjoy playing Wordle, and I, I see, you know, a lot of people have posted, like, solvers and analytics and this thing, I see lots of people complaining, oh, God, you're trying to take all the fun out of the game, where's your, you know, where's your soul, live a bit, etc. Um, you know, I, I play Wordle, uh, you know, just casually on my phone. Um, I don't, you know, try to, uh, try to analyze it myself, but it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting problem to play around with, and so that's uh, that's why I do it. I don't do it to try to cheat to make my score better, because I don't know who you'd be trying to prove anything to. But there you go. thought I'd address that, since a lot of people ask about it. So what I have made is this little Wordle helper. So the idea is, let's say I started off with trace. So I'll put in my guess here, and I'll put in the response. So that's green, yellow, gray, gray, gray. Uh, it's unfortunate that green and gray start with the same letter. It would have been easier to code this otherwise, but the way I've done this is G for green, Y for yellow, and X for gray. And so you'll see that that's kind of how that shows up there. And then what this can tell me is, uh, you know, you start off with 2,300 possible words. Um, there's, there's just a, a kind of known list of possible Wordle words. Actually, I guess I should get into this just while I'm talking about it. So there are 2,315, or maybe now with the New York Times version, I think they've taken a few out, it's slightly less, but you know, approximately 2,300 words that are valid answers. So abaca, base, abate, abi, abbot, abhor, etc. Uh, and then in addition to that, there are another uh, just over 10,000 words which are not ever going to be the answer, but you are allowed to guess them. So in other words, your guess has to be a valid word. Uh, so it could be ad, or ali, or arg, or arti, or abaca, or abakai, etc. Uh, even though 
it, you know, those will never be the answer. So of the 2,315 possible words, there are actually only 11 that match this pattern. In other words, they have a T in the first position, an R, but not in the second position, no A, no C, and no E. Uh, and then if you want to take it a step further, it will actually show you what are those 11 words. You've got third, thorn, throb, throw, thrum, torso, torus, tumor, turbo, tutor, and twirl. Uh, and then down below, so in black it shows you the actual uh, the valid answers, and then down below that in grey it shows you all the possible guesses that are also compatible with uh, with this pattern. So in other words, you know, T at the start, R not in the second position, and no A, C, or E. Uh, the reason <coughs> that I have all these things that are not possible answers in here is one of the reasons you might want to use this, uh, this sort of helper is if you want to play Wordle in hard mode. Uh, and the idea in hard mode, uh, I think it says it's somewhere here. No, it doesn't. Uh, no, it's here. Oh, yeah. So in hard mode, any revealed hints have to be used in subsequent guesses. So in other words, if I find this, then my next guess has to have a T, an R somewhere. Uh, I don't know if you're allowed to put it in the second position again, if that counts as being compatible with the available information. I don't play in hard mode, so I'm not sure about that. But anyway, uh, so these are the... Uh, the actual answers at the top and then all the other possible guesses further down that are compatible with that. Um, and then let's see, I put in trite and got the same pattern and it tells you that doesn't actually help you very much, it only takes off another three words. So here you've gone from 2000 to 11 words, you've got basically a 100% reduction, 99.5, uh, but here you've only taken off 27%. So one of the things you can use this for is, you know, once you've played your game, type in your string of moves here and your responses here and you'll get a sense of either how good were your moves or how lucky were your moves or a bit of both. Um, do, 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 do. So, uh, yeah, let me let me show you some of the workings of this and then I'll, uh, I'll show you a couple of other things after that as well. So first things first, uh, we're gonna obviously you take in the word, uh, I've, I've had people, you know, type in the word here rather than typing into five individual spaces because that's just kind of more like how people really put things in Excel. Uh, but then I'm using the mid function to split that up and the upper function to make it uppercase. Uh, and let me just open up the rest of my workings over here so you can see what's going on. So here I've just got, you know, the numbers one to five and that gets referenced here. So I say mid of that. So mid takes the characters from this string starting at position this, which is one, two, three, four, and five, uh, and going for one character. So in other words, this gives me the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth letters and makes them all uppercase. Uh, and then I split out the second piece, the, um, the response in the same way so that I can do my analysis on those. So now let's talk about how can you turn this information that you get from Wordle into something Excel can use. So the best way is if you know how to use Excel's wildcards uh, for text. And that is a question mark can mean any one character and an asterisk or a star can mean any string of characters. So for example, a five letter word that starts with W is that pattern. It's W followed by any four other characters. Uh, and the other one that's helpful, and you're gonna need it in a minute, is uh, this is not equal to, so it's less than, greater than. Obviously, you think of it in the context of numbers. It's neither, neither. Uh, so it's either greater than or less than, so it's not the same as. Uh, so in this case, something that does not have I, a five-letter word that does not have I in the second position would be that pattern, not anything followed by I, followed by, sorry, any one character followed by I, followed by any three characters. Uh, and something that doesn't contain U at all would be not something followed by you, followed by something. Um, and then again, this is where the kind of fun nuance comes in. You know, if, let's say, there was another you that was um, that was yellow, and then this you that was gray, then instead of that, you would want to say it doesn't contain two yous, and the way you do that would be doesn't contain something followed by you, followed by something, followed by you, followed by something. And any of these stars could be nothing. So, I don't know, the word jewel, uh, the the e sigs uh, would match uh, not not with the not obviously but would match that pattern star u star u star um, 
So that's one we have to be a little bit careful about with the greys. And then the other thing is, for the greens and the greys, we just have one pattern, which is, you know, here it's starts with W and here it doesn't contain U or doesn't contain some number of U's. For yellow, it doesn't have I in the second position, but does have I, uh, which is something like that. Or, uh, again, it could be if you've got a... Um, let's say, for example, that we had... Buddy, and we've got XXYXX. So here you've got a yellow, which is telling you there is a D, but not in that position. Here you've got a gray, which is telling you not that there's no D, but that there aren't two Ds. But then if you switch this, if you say uh, there's a green and a yellow, so then here you're saying there's not a D in the fourth position, but there are two Ds rather than just one D, uh, because otherwise you're not using all the information. So in other words, again, this could be star i, star, or if there's an i somewhere else that also matches, then it could be that to say there's at least two i's. So how do we make that happen? Let's come over here. So we've basically got two, uh, let me just color code these so you can see the difference. So let's make this one yellow. So I've got the first block, which is just splitting out the five response characters. I've got the second block, which is giving me one set of filters, and then I've got the third block, which is giving me the additional filters f related to yellows, because like I said, each yellow requires two filters. So first of all, the filter for the first character. So I, I have a no match on B. That means my pattern is not something followed by B followed by something. Same thing, no match on U. Uh, I've got a D in the third position, so it's any two characters followed by D followed by any two characters. And then in the fourth position, it's not any three characters followed by D followed by any one character. So how do we how do we do that? So first we're just checking if the word is blank, and if it is, then anything matches, which is just star. Then if it's not, so X is a little bit different from the others. If it's not X, in other words, if it's green or yellow, then the main piece is this, substitute. So I'm saying take five question marks, and use substitute to replace question mark with the current letter, which is this G3, so B in this case, uh, in the, in this case first, but in the whatever position number we're in, occurrence of that letter. So in other words, you know, here I'm replacing, let's go, so here I'm replacing the third instance, because uh, this is a three up here. Here I'm replacing the fourth instance because it's a four up here. Uh, and then in front of that I'm saying if it's a G then put nothing in front of it. If it's a Y then put a not in front of it. So here I'm saying I've got a, a green here so I want a D in the third position. Here I'm saying I've got a, a yellow so I do not want a D in the fourth position. And then the, so that's all the if it's not a gray and then if it is a gray then I want not star and then I'm going to repeat that letter and a star some number of times uh, according to uh, how many times it's supposed to be in there so in this case you know my B U and Y are all saying there's no B's no U's and no Y's but if I go back over here and switch back to the case where I had uh, you know a, a yellow D and a gray D, now my gray condition is going to say, rather than saying not D, it's going to say not two Ds. So this is counting how many times uh, in the string of letters do I have this letter where it's not an X. In other words, how many yellows plus greens do I have? Because yellows plus greens is the number of times that it validly appears, and so I want to repeat one more time than that. So in other words, here it validly appears once, so I want to say it doesn't appear twice. And then similar logic for the repetition on the yellow. So here I'm saying, you know, uh, contains a D, but not in the third position. But if I go back to the situation where I was saying there was a green and a yellow, then my second, so my first filter on yellow is now saying no D in the fourth position, but my second filter on yellow is saying, but there are two Ds, not just one. So there's one D in the third position, and in total there are at least two Ds. So that's uh, that's the sort of 10 different filters that you put together, and then how do we turn that into a word list? Well, we come over to this uh, list of words, uh, and so here I've just transposed the list of input words 
from here on down. Uh, I'll show you why there's eight of them when you can only make five guesses before your final answer in, in a little bit. Uh, and then beneath each one of those, it transposes the list of filters. So for buddy, I've got you know no Bs, no Us, D in the third position, uh, no D in the fourth position, no Ys, and uh, oh, sorry, I've got frozen panes on, so you can't scroll down, uh, and uh, at least two Ds in total. So close that up. And then all I do is a big count if. So I, I just basically have these kind of nesting one down from the other. So I start off with a one next to every word. And then for each word, I say, if there is a one in the previous position, then do all these checks to see if it matches the filter. And if it's already been ruled out, then just leave it as zero. So you'll see, basically that just means I don't have to do calculations you know, 10 times. Usually you'll cut down the list very quickly. So like in this case, you've cut down to 37 words. Uh, after the first, um, yeah, to 37 words, including only two valid words and 35 possible guesses uh, after the first guess. So in other words, I don't want to have to do my calculations. There are 13,000 rows here. I don't have to do my calculations 13,000 times uh, when I've already ruled a word, ruled a word out. Uh, and so then that count ifs is just basically saying how many times is that word each of these 10 patterns, so d2, d3, d4, d5, d6, uh, and so on. Uh, and then once I've done that, the rest of it is, is pretty straightforward. So my possible words, I'm just going to say, uh, if I've filled in, so the count blank is saying both of these have to be filled in, I need a guess and a response. You could do more error checking to say, you know, make sure they're both five characters, you could check if this is a valid word, whatever. I mean, you know, if you want to break this, I'm sure you'll find a way to break this, but uh, that's that's the idea. So check if, it, if it's been filled in, and if it has, then uh, sum the number of valid words. Uh, so sum the number of cases where there's a one in the corresponding word number. So you know after filtering for one word, two words, three words, four words, five words, and where uh, the answer, where it's on the answer list, not just the valid guess list. Uh, and in that case, this gives there's only two matches here, which is dodge and otter. Um, and then, yeah, the filter is just saying, you know, we filter the list of words, A and B, uh, so that the B part is hidden, but let's show you that. <clears throat> so I'm filtering the word and whether it's an answer or not, uh, where uh, workings K, which is the last column, where that's equal to 1. Uh, and then I get my Y and N, and then I do a conditional formatting, um, which it doesn't, uh, it doesn't show it there, but because it's um, because it's applying to the what do you call it the dynamic range uh, that that basically expands and contracts, and it basically says if the hidden column is an N, then just gray it out. So that lets me visually see. Okay, so these are the two possible answers, and then these are all the other possible guesses if I'm playing in hard mode. Um, yeah, so that's that's basically the idea. You can, like I said, you can either kind of use it to say, okay, I'm stuck, I can't even figure out what word would match here, uh, or you can use it, you know, after the fact to say, okay, well, I guessed buddy, and then I guessed four other things and eventually got it, but actually after buddy there were only two possible answers, so I guess I didn't do great. Or you can say, whatever, you know, on, on each guess I got an, at least a 90% reduction in the number of words, so I was going pretty well, or, or whatever. Uh, so that's what you can do with that. Part two. Uh, so this is all about, you know, just just finding words that match. Part two, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how you think about solving Wordle from a sort of computer science perspective. And I'll, I'll preface this by saying, you know, there's lots of other great, uh, like really, really interesting, smart, intelligent work out there on this. Uh, I'm not going to try and reinvent the wheel completely, so I'll, I'll add a couple of new things and, and show you a thing or two, but uh, I recommend, uh, in particular, I recommend you check out, and I'll put the link down below, this blog post by Laurent Lessard, who is a uh, engineering or computer science professor, he's certainly a computer science wizard anyway, um, and puzzle enthusiast, who has written just a f really good and extremely thorough uh, blog with uh, with a collaborator who I think is a Google engineer or something who, who helped him kind of optimize the code uh, and then they ran this on some enormous you know mainframe for many days they've got 
very, very comprehensive answers, including a complete analysis of, uh, of Wordle in hard mode, uh, and just a really, really nice write-up. Um, and also this, uh, this video, uh, Solving Wordle Using Information Theory by 3 Blue 1 Brown, is just absolutely beautiful. Uh, like really, really, really nicely presented um, and just kind of talks you through the ideas really, really neatly. Um, and then the other uh, the other one in Excel land is this video uh, by Mr. Excel, Bill Jellin. Uh, Excel doing billions of calculations to study Wordle. I'm going to show you kind of my equivalent of this, um, but there's another, another very nice video there as well. Uh, so having said that, let me show you my version. Um, so uh, this part is not quite so neatly formatted, but basically this piece up here is a uh, like a, a Wordle answer calculator. So given a word and a guess, it works out the score for that. Uh, sadly, I've been inconsistent between my files. Uh, I went with you know G for green and Y for yellow and X for gray and the other one. And this one I've gone for two is green and one is yellow, and zero is uh, is gray. Uh, oops, but anyway, that's life. Uh, did I have anything? No, I'll, I'll leave that open for now. Anyway, so the idea is, again, basically you split the word up into uh, five pieces. Um, you know, is it green? Is very, very simple. Just, is that letter the same as that letter? Uh, and then to handle the nuances of multiple letters, uh, I do a second version of this, which just shows me the non-matched letters. So if it's not green, then show me the letters. Uh, because these are the ones that I'm interested in looking at for greys and yellows. And then I figure out the yellows by saying uh, is the number of yellows that has appeared so far in the word reading left to right, so you can see this this bottom piece expands, uh, is that greater than or equal to the total number of uh, of those words, of those that letter, sorry, that appears up here. So for example, in this case, I'm looking at ends. Well, I've already matched the one end that exists, so there are no non-matched ends, which means that neither of these ends gets a yellow. So those are both zero. Um, and then the O, uh, the O gets a match because that's there in a different position. Uh, and the way I've written the formula, it also returns a one for, for greens, and that's deliberate so that then when you sum them up, uh, anything where there's a green, you get a two, anything where there's a yellow, you get a one, and anything where there's not either a green or a yellow, that's going to be your gray. And then you can just concatenate those together. Uh, and then the, the thing that forms the sort of core of the solution of this is basically taking that string, that innocent looking string of five characters, uh, and turning it into a table, basically figuring out what is that value for all 2,300 possible answers and for all 13,000 possible guesses that you could throw at them, which is, I think, in total something like 30 million uh, possible intersections. Um, and, you know, Bill Jellin called his video on this, Excel does 1.5 billion calculations to solve Wordle. Uh, I think I've been a little bit more um, terse in my formula writing, uh, but it by coincidence rather than design, I, I did count. I've got um, I've got a total of 36 formulas here, and if I say 36 times uh, count a of all this, I have got just a hair over one billion uh, formulas being repeated in this uh, in this table. Um, and similar to uh, similar to Bill's experience, this took about an hour to calculate. I've since copied and pasted values. There's a live version in a, in a different spreadsheet, but it's, uh, it's a lot of overhead to keep going in Excel, but that ran in about an hour. Um, and once you have this, you can do all kinds of, uh, all kinds of analysis to figure out, you know, for example, okay, if I guess odd, these are all the different uh, possible answers that I can get. So then, you know, how many different possibilities are there if I guess odd and the answer is, Two one zero zero zero. Well, the answer is there are these sixteen possible words. Okay, and what if instead of getting two one zero zero zero, I guess I get zero one two. Oops, no, zero one two none. All right, let's say zero two zero zero two. There are these four possible words. But then if I'm not so lucky, I don't get any twos. Maybe I get zero zero one. I don't know. Yeah, zero zero one zero zero. Now suddenly I've got one hundred and fifty two words that match. And if I get super unlucky, or actually not all that unlucky, because Lots of words don't match it. Uh, I get 
no all gray tiles, then there are 448 words that are still possible after that. So one way that you can handle this, uh, and it'll feed nicely into other analysis I want to do in a little bit, is to just take that whole table, that you know 13,000 column by 2,000 row table, and put it in a pivot table, uh, and put as your field the count of possible words. And then what you can do uh, is you can take whatever word you want to put in, let's say we want to make Sudsy our guess. So you put that in the rows, and then you get this thing that says, okay, there are 890 possible words where the match on Sudsy is all greys. There are 37 possible words where the match on Sudsy is one yellow. In other words, there are 37 words that have no S's, no U's, no D's, one Y that is not in the last position. Uh, and then, you know, there are 175 words that have no S's, U's, or D's, and a Y that is in the last position, and so on. And so what you can do, you can basically, you know, take each of these, divide them by the 2,300 words that we have in total to get a probability, and then you can sort this and graph it in a chart like this. Um, and you can say, okay, so there is a 38% probability that you'll end up in this huge bucket of 890 words uh, that don't match anything. There's a, let's say, 6% probability that you get a match, a yellow on the second tile and gray on everything else, uh, and so on. And then, this is actually one of the things that uh, Laurent's write-up does really, really nicely, is it shows, like, talks about how should you think about what are the metrics to optimize on. And one of the things he talks nicely about is how there is no kind of unique solution to uh, to kind of the best next move unless you solve the whole game, which is basically computationally intractable uh, with current machinery at least. And so there's lots of different. So in other words, he charts all these uh, all these splits just like this. So you know, basically versions of uh, of this chart here. Um, so obviously he's got it going left to right and just showing the total number of words on a log scale. But so you can see, you know, here's adieu, and it's got you know. It splits it into about 80 different possibilities, and they look like this. Here's trace, and it splits it into more like 150 different possibilities, and it's a much flatter curve. So you can see that in some cases, you know, this is clearly giving you more information than this one is. But you know, how do you compare between these different things? He talks about a few different ways you can do it, uh, which I have put in my file here. Um, so one way that you can think about it is, what is the number of sets that you split it into, which is just the count of these. So you know, in theory, there can be there's three um, th like three possible responses for each of the five tiles. So you could, in theory, get three to the fifth power, which is 243 different responses. But in practice, you know, you can't you can't get all of that. So, for example, you could never get four greens and a yellow because if you've got four tiles in the right place and you've got the other tile, then it has to be in the right place by definition. Um, but you know, in, in practice, it's much, much more than just those few theoretical edge cases. The most you can get in anything is like 150, 160, something like that. So one thing you can look at is what's the what's the uh, number of sets that I can split it into, um, and that is basically looking at you know how far out along this axis do the different words go. Another thing you can look at is what's the biggest single set. So in other words, you could say, okay, well, you know, stump splits it into more sets than I do, but you've got this chance of having this, you know, really awful, very high peak that's going to be, you know, that means that you don't get very far. So if you're thinking about worst case, then you want to know which has the lowest peak. So you want to solve for what is, what's the best for, uh, you know, what's the smallest, biggest set that you can get. Uh, and then you can also think about this measure of entropy, which again, Laurent talks about a little bit, and that's, that's what this, uh, this, three blue one brown video just does a really beautiful job of explaining uh, in a very visual way it's just super super enjoyable um, you know what what does that measure mean but this is basically telling you you know this guessing this word gives you on average 3.6 bits of information so I mentioned in the solver earlier you know you know you might say whatever trace is my usual word and today it got uh, you know it took me from 2315. Uh, words down to 11, uh, which is a 99.5% reduction. Uh, if I plug in trace over here, I can see, you know, how uh, 
how lucky that was. Um, and so, let's see, I had 11 words. So, um, let's see, 11 over 2315, 0.5%. So, where's my 0.5% range? So, I'm right around here. So, you know, there's a lot of a lot of cases where you do uh, where you do worse than that. So that was, you know, for for trace, which is my go-to first word every day. You know, today was a pretty lucky day to get all the way down to 11 words. Uh, it would be more normal. And actually, I have this. I'll talk about this in a second. I have this average set size here. So on average, you'll end up with uh, a set of size 74 if you start with trace. Um, and yeah, anyway, I'm not going to say any more about the entropy because it's it's pretty technical. Um, so the interesting thing, again, Laurent's article talks a little bit about, a little bit about this, is that for each of these four different metrics that you might think of as you know four different ways of saying how good a job does this word do of taking us toward the solution, that actually every single one of them suggests a different best first guess. So you know the thing that's uh, the thing that splits it into the greatest number of sets is trace. You get 150 uh, different sets, but the biggest set has 246 elements, uh, and that's you know if there's no T R A C or E, there's 246 words left. If you want the you know lowest worst case, then raise does much better on that. The worst case is 168 uh, because these are you know a much more common set of letters. Um, SOAR, S-O-A-R-E, uh, gives you the the biggest reduction in entropy for a single guess. Uh, and then the interesting thing, the, the one that I haven't seen out in the world, uh, is w when I think about the average set. Uh, and what do I mean by that? You, you might be tempted to say, well, you know, and actually I had an exchange with uh, <laughs> with Dan Mayo about this, where we were trying to wrap our heads around the, the non-intuitiveness of it. Um, you know, you might be tempted to say, well, there are 2,300 words, uh, and you split it into 150 sets, so the average set size is 2,315 over 150. But actually, the, in terms of how likely are you to end up in different places, that's not quite the right way to think about it. So let me just show you a super simple example here. Let's say I have... Uh, three words, and then with some guess, I split them uh, so that I can, you know, if there's one answer, I can distinguish two of them, and if there's another answer, I, I know one of them uniquely. Well then, what's the average number of sets? I've split it into two, so you could think of the average as, well, three sets divided by two is 1.5, but in terms of where am I likely to end up? Well, I have two chances of ending up in the two bucket and only one chance of ending up in the one bucket. So I've got one here, two here and two here. So my average of those is actually five over three or 1.6666666. Uh, and so the average set size, and then, you know, if you end up with an extreme case, like, I don't know, you know, half of all your answers are lumped into one bucket and then the other half are all uniquely determined, uh, then you can end up with with cases where the average set size looks very different. Um, and so, you know, if you look at a chart like this or a distribution like this, you know, there are 246 words that could end up in that 0000, 000, 000, 000, 000 bucket for trace. Then basically what that means is the contribution to, if you think about adding up, you know, for all 2,315 words, what is the number of words in the set after that first guess? Well, for all 246 of these, the contribution is 246. For all 123 of these, the contribution is 123, and so on down. And so basically, to work out that average set number, you just add up the sum of the squares of these numbers in, in, each, uh, in each part of the split divided by the sum. And so in this case, that tells you for trace, the average, the average number of words that you have left to choose among in other words, the average number that you will get here after playing the word trace on the first turn is 74. But actually, if you play rote, uh, you end up with a value of 60.4, which is uh, which is the best you can get there. And so, you know, if, if you feel inclined to do that, you can basically, you know, play this forward. You can say, well, okay, so this tells me, you, you decide which of these metrics you're you're interested in, whether it's, you know, the average set size or the number of sets or the maximum set or the entropy, you optimize on that and then you can say, okay, so based on that, 
you know, I can run all uh, all you know thirteen thousand words through this pivot table, uh, and I've got a little you know macro that that will do that for me. Uh, let me just pull that up here quickly. It's it's very simple. Um, so I just rather than kind of naming cells or anything, I just select uh, just unhide here. Uh, so I just select a list of words before I run the macro, and then for each uh, for each cell in the selection. Um, ignore that part. Uh, take the first pivot table, add that as a pivot table field, make it a row field, and put it in this position, so which counts up, you know, one, two, three, four, five, um, and then record whatever value. So in this case, I'm interested in the average set value. Record that value over here, uh, and then you know, carry on running it for all. 13,000 words, and then once I've done that, I can sort on that column and find out, okay, wrote is the best one there. And then what you can do is you can say, okay, well, I guessed wrote, so let me uh, try to take out trace. Wrote. So I guessed that, uh, and then let's say the answer was, I don't know, uh, yellow, yellow, gray, yellow, yellow, gray. So now I've got 12 possible words left, and then, you know, you could run the macro again to say among those, uh, you know, for, for those 12 possible words, what's the best next move you could play? And then, I don't know, whatever, let's say you play lions as your next move. Pull that down there, and now that splits it into, you know, one set of two possible words, one set of five possible words, one of two, one of two, and one of one, depending on the different answers. And maybe you can find a better word that splits it into, uh, into even more. Um, and so you can you can basically run it that way as a sort of greedy algorithm that at each step you find the next word that gives you the best possible score on whichever one of these metrics you're interested in, uh, and then you filter for the, the values you've got so far and so on. Um, the only challenge is it's you know it's Excel is pretty fast, pivot tables are pretty fast, but it's no match for you know uh, C or or some other you know high speed programming language when it comes to this kind of thing. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try to suggest you should uh, solve Wordle in this way. It's not uh, it's not super efficient. But it's interesting to know you can do it. Uh, the one other thing I want to show you is um, and this is you know somewhat my uh, my little you know contribution to the world. Um, you know Excel is not really fast enough to say well, given the first three guesses I've made and the responses to those, now run all 13,000 possible guesses again and figure out the next move. You know, the, it would be s possible, but slow to do that. But what you can do is you can say, how much information can I get from a, a few starting guesses without updating for the information that I've got from the ones so far? In other words, you know, okay, I guess wrote as my first word, but rather than filtering after that, Let's just say I throw in another guess on top of that. So now I've got rote and lions. So, you know, if they both come up all blank, that's 19 possible words. If rote comes up all gray and lions comes up with two yellow tiles at the end, that's two possible words and so on. Um, and so you can you can basically say in a kind of greedy approach, and that's, that's what that macro I showed you briefly earlier was doing. So you can say, you know, first for all 13,000 words, work out what is their average number after uh, after just putting in that word. Then lock in that word as your first guess. Then among all the 13,000 possible next guesses, what's the average? So that's basically what this is doing here. It says, if you guess wrote as your first guess, you'll have an average set size of 60.4. If you guess lins as your second guess, you'll have an average set size after those two guesses of 5.1. If you guess chump as your third guess, you'll get an average set size of 1.6. Uh, if you get glebby as your fourth guess, you'll have an average set size of just over 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, so in other words, you know, you can get down to, you know, one or two, occasionally three or four, uh, and in, in like one case, six uh, answers just by this handful of guesses without um, without ever factoring in the new information that you've that you've got hold of from your answers. Um, and where that gets interesting, and this is, I told you I was going to come back later and show you why I have eight spaces in here when there are only ever five guesses that you need to take into account. And that's because if, you know, 
Wordle is uh, is not cool enough for you anymore, then you should check out Quirtle. Uh, Quirtle is a trickier version of Wordle, and basically the idea is you play, it's a mix of quad and Wordle, you play four games of Wordle at the same time uh, with the same guess going into each grid and giving you feedback on each one. Uh, and so I actually found this uh, this set of starting guesses here, uh, Rote, Linz, and Chumpy, or sorry, Rote, Linz, and Chump, uh, are, are, like I said, the best three on a greedy basis. There may be, you know, if you're not solving just one one at a time, if you look at all, you know, 13,000, choose three different possible sets. Good luck, God bless. But if you're able to do it, you might find something better. But on a greedy basis, Rote is the best, and Linz is the best you can add to Rote, and Chump is the best you can add to Rote and Linz. Uh, and if you play those first three guesses, um, then... You, I've found I can often uh, kind of from there try and finish Quirtle off in, uh, in you know, that gives me enough information to kind of guess at least one of them and that gives me enough to get the next one out. So let me just show you that really quickly. So we'll put in Rote, we'll put in Linz, and we'll put in Chump. And then let's have a quick gawk. This is a, a practice mode, so you get a random one. I have no idea what words I'm getting here. But so, for example, if I look up here, I've got an L, a D, an M, an E, and an O. So now, you know, in, in again, in the real world, I don't try to use Excel to solve everything. I just then, you know, stare at this for a while and try and figure it out in my head. But uh, for this purpose, let's see if we can use the two tools together to crack it. So first one is gray, green, gray, gray, yellow. So X, G, X, X, Y. So I'm already down to 21 words. Then Linz is yellow, gray, gray, yellow, gray, down to two words, and then chump, x, 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 y, x. And so my answer is model. So now let's see which other one. Oh, okay, so this one is an excellent match on rote right from the start. So let's fill that one in and see what we get. So we get yellow, 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 gray, green. You're already down to just two words, a door and a rose. Uh, and let's see, there's an S, so that means it has to be a rose. So we get that one. Uh, all right, so now it looks like either of these we can probably get, but let's start with this one. So rote is XXXXG, Linz is XXGXY, and that gets me down to sense. Awesome. Uh, and then the last one, rote, is YXXYX, is it? Yes. Linz is XXXXY. Chump is XXGXY, and the answer is spurt. And so, just like that, you can get it on the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh guesses. So there's, that's why I said there's up to eight in here because in theory, in Quirtle, you have uh, nine guesses because you know you have six guesses in traditional Wordle plus then it takes you a seventh, eighth, and ninth uh, word to finish off each of the other three games if you if you play it that way. So. That's a pretty good challenge. Put in uh, put in those first three words and then see if you can get it out on the next four guesses. Uh, all right, I think that's all I've got for today. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, you know, feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff, uh, or not. I won't be offended if you don't. Thanks for watching.